I would also like to thank uh, Chairman of the Board of NDIA, uh, Ms. Sid Ashworth. Uh, Sid and I have known each other for decades. Uh, she is an incredible leader. She's an incredible uh, person, and what she has done in support of this nation and what she does for us daily in NDIA is amazing. So, ma'am, thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you here. So the current commander of NORAD NORTHCOM is probably, in my humble opinion, one of the greatest leaders one of the most capable and competent operational warfighters our nation has ever produced. She happens to be a woman, and she happens to be my best friend. So it is an honor to, for me to introduce uh, Lori Robinson. You can all read much about her in, your, in a variety of ways. You pick up a paper, you read about Lori Robinson in today's environment. Uh, but I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things that mean a lot to me about the, who this person is and what kind of leader she is. I'll start with, because of her incredible skill and talent, she kept me from flunking a weapons instructor course ride when I was a captain and she was a lieutenant a long time ago. Not significant to a lot of people, but it meant a lot to me. So uh, that's another story that we can tell over time. She has commanded at Squadron Group Wing, uh, the largest command in the Air Force and the combatant command. She is the first female combatant commander in the United States military. Uh, she has done things like she was the commander of a weapons school division, the teacher of the teachers, the best of the best for the United States Air Force at Nellis is the only female commander at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. And she excelled. She rose to the top because of who she is and the talent that she has. She's been responsible for all interaction of the United States Air Force with Congress for a couple of years, which is a battle space all its own, as you well know, uh, and did that job at a level to this day, my humble opinion, she is the best legislative liaison the Air Force has ever had. She ran, day to day, ran the entire air war in the Middle East, from Afghanistan to Syria, from the Iraq-Turkey border to the Horn of Africa. Day to day as a deputy commander of the Air Forces Central. She was the vice commander of the largest command in the United States Air Force, Air Combat Command, responsible for about 120,000 uh, airmen and about uh, 1,500 aircraft. She commanded all air forces in the Pacific Command uh, and actually fixed everything that I couldn't because uh, she followed me in that position. And now, as I said, she is the first female combatant commander in the United States military. She has led young men and women in combat. She has taken care, protected, grown, nurtured, and mentored our daughters and sons. And there is nobody, in my opinion, that is a better example for everybody to follow than the commander of NORAD NORTHCOM, General Lori Robinson. Please. Um, can I roam around down here because it's much more comfortable for me to do that than standing up on a stage, if you all don't mind. Um, so I often get the question, did you have uh, women that you could look up to um, to be the person that you are today? And I say, no, actually, ma'am, it's good to see you. I didn't, I had Hawk Carlisle. I, and I mean this in all sincerity. Hawk told you that we've known each other since he was a captain and I was a lieutenant. I had the absolute privilege of following him in a couple of places. But most importantly, I had the privilege of Hawk being a leader and a mentor and a best friend. Um, and so, Hawk, uh, to be here today, I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate it. I appreciate, I'm humbled by your introduction. Um, I'm just little Lori Robinson as far as I'm concerned. So I'm gonna talk about a couple things. And then I know that you all uh, might have a question or 10. Um, I've got a little bit of time, but it's a little busy out there. Um, so let's talk about a couple things. First of all, I, I'm a commander of two separate and distinct commands, but with a, comp a, a, a common purpose, and that's to defend the United States, and in the air domain, to defend the United States and Canada. Um, and, and so as the commander of NORAD, 
Uh, my roles and responsibilities are aerospace warning, aerospace control, and maritime warning. Uh, you know, and it, what was interesting, I didn't realize this uh, until I went through the confirmation process, but I had to interview with the Chief of Canadian Defence Staff, General Vance, uh, who had to then write a letter to the Prime Minister of Canada, who then wrote a letter to the President of the United States saying, yes, yeah, she'll do. And, um, and, then, and then it went over to uh, the Senate. The interesting part is I had to interview with General Vance. And uh, so when I interviewed with General Vance, I was on leave. And it was March. And he's like, Lori, I understand you're on leave in Tahiti. And I said, well, sir, let me just be a little more specific. I'm on leave in Tahiti in one of those little huts over the water with the glass <laughs> and the fish and the umbrella drink. And he said, it's snowing in Ottawa. <laughs> and I said, here, do you want to log on the fire? But, but I had to do that. And it's really important to understand that in my commander of NORAD hat, you know, I work for the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada. So when we do things like change aerospace control levels, when I make a decision to move force structure around in Canada and Alaska and possibly on the West Coast of California, those decisions aren't made unilaterally. They're in concert with my two bosses. Uh, and I think it's really important that we, that, uh, you know, that we understand that. In my NORTHCOM hat, I work for the President and the Secretary of Defense. And in my NORTHCOM hat, I'm responsible for ballistic missile defense of the United States of America. Uh, in my NORTHCOM hat, I'm responsible for defense support to civil authorities. Now, when I got to um, Northern Command about a year and a half ago, uh, I was there for about a week or so, and we had this exercise that was called Ardent Sentry. And this exercise was all about uh, a, um, an earthquake on the I-5 corridor out west uh, in uh, you know Oregon, California, and Washington, uh, and then it was going to be a tsunami, and then more corridors and, and pestilence. I'm sure after that. But I had no idea because of everything that I had done in my United States Air Force, we didn't do this defense support to civil authorities. And so to understand the role and relationship that we have, you know, supporting FEMA in that exercise and the things that we bring to bear as the Department of Defense uh, in that exercise was just huge. And it taught me a lot about the relationship between me and the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA uh, as well as the National Guard, as well as other instruments of power to take care of and support a governor of a state to ensure that the things that they can do to win the, and ensure and keep care of the hearts and minds of the members of their state was just huge. And I learned an awful lot. And as you can imagine, probably for the last five we weeks, I've learned an awful lot. <laughs> But the other thing is theater security cooperation. And so obviously with Canada and the binational command of uh, NORAD, I have a deep relationship with Canada. In fact, just last night, I had the privilege uh, to go to the swearing in ceremony of the new ambassador of Canada uh, and um, a deep relationship with Mexico uh, as we work with them. And then, of course, the third country that I'm responsible for theater security cooperation is Bahamas. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. That's... I want to, you know, I talk about my role and responsibility of defending the homeland. And in the air domain, defending the homelands, Canada and the United States. You know, people often think that if you think about defending the homeland, that means you need to necessarily have maybe stuff here in the United States and Canada to do that. And of course, it's very important. But what I also rely on are my brothers downrange, whether it's Harry Harris or Vince uh, Brooks uh, in uh, Korea or Hawaii or Joe Votel in Central Command or, or General Scaparotti, you know, in European Command or Tony Thomas all over the world in Special Operations Command. Everything that they do each and every day defends the homeland. It takes care of things here. And so the more I rely on them to do the things that they're doing, the better off it is for each and every one of us every day. But that doesn't mean, as I look at the way that the chairman and the secretary are talking about the threats, that doesn't mean 
that I don't pay attention each and every day. So let's, I'll talk about uh, the four plus one. You've heard everybody talk about that. So let's talk about North Korea, right? So there's this guy that as we've watched, even in my very short time in Northcom and in my very short time of watching what he's doing, the things that, the amount of things that he's increased in his capability and capacity has been amazing. Right, if we sit back and we watch about indications and warnings and we see that that's changing, we look at the fact that he's tested 30% more than his father and grandfather combined. And we look at the speed and with rapidity that he does the testing and he's not afraid to fail in public. We should worry, and I know we are, but I watch what his capability is, and obviously he's working very hard on his capability, and I know he's gonna work very hard on his capacity, but we can see a ton of intent. And so I have to tell you, as the commander of Northern Command, I can tell you today, I'm confident in our ability to defend the United States. But that doesn't mean we stop here. That means we continue to work on uh, better discriminating sensors. That means we continue to work on reliability of kill vehicles. And that means we continue to work on our ground-based interceptors. So I sit back and, and I can tell you, I think that, I think he has my Friday afternoon schedule. <laughs> you know, I, a couple of nights sitting with my cell phone on my chest and, and uh, waiting to have some phone calls. Um, I worry about his intent, and, and, uh, and, I, and I know that he's working on capability and capacity. So let's talk about Russia. If I look in my air domain hat as the commander of NORAD, uh, I sit back and while we talk a lot and look a lot about Russia in Europe and the Baltics and all that, I know that he's working on capability increasing his capability, and holding targets at risk at ranges we're not used to, both in Canada and the United States. I know that he's also uh, looking at building that ca capacity. What's different in a kinetic sense in the air domain, we don't see that against the United States or Canada. But what I do see and what I saw in April was four times. You know, we had long range aviation flying off the coast of Alaska. Hawk, you'd be really excited. I have this amazing picture of two Canadian F 18s, a bear bomber, and a raptor. And it just doesn't get any better than that. That is air power right there. But you know, as we watch and see what Russia decides to do in the Baltics and decides to do in Syria, you know, I'm I pay attention to see, are, is he going to fly more east of the Urals? And I pay attention to that. Again, capability, yes. Capacity, yes. Intent in the air domain kinetically against the United States right now, no. So I look at China and we watch what China is doing, you know, and we watch them going outside of the first and second island chain. We watch, you know, as they've been moving about, again, watching their capability and what can that do to the homeland each and every day. And I watch Iran too. I watch Iran because as we sit back and we watch their ability to, to build space launch vehicles, can they take that, that technology and make it so that it can threaten the homeland? Can it threaten us today? No. But what, what are they working on? What can they do from a, from a capability perspective um, that can threaten the homeland? And so I pay attention, as I've mentioned to Congress on, on several occasions, you know, I have an eye and a half where I watched North Korea and this other half of an eye is paying attention to what's happening in Iran to make sure that we are, we are correctly postured should they change their capability and add to any capacity. And finally, you know, whether it, we call it the uh, VEO, the transnational organizations, 
Uh, Admiral Kurt Tidd and I work very closely together uh, about the pathways that come from Europe, enter South America, up through Central America, through Mexico, and possibly into the United States. You know, and we, he and I talk about the fact that it's pathways. The commodity is interesting, um, but what's important to us is understanding the pathways, to illuminate those pathways, and, and to um, do anything we can to support lead federal agencies to help with the commodity, whatever that commodity might be, whether it's drugs, whether it's special interest aliens, you know, whether it's uh, human trafficking. Uh, it's important to us that pathway to illuminate and to give any information we can to lead federal agencies to, you know, to take things off the pathway. Because at the end of the day, you know, the concern that we might have might be somebody coming from our southern border uh, into the United States. Uh, I am telling you here at United States Northern Command, uh, we have such an amazing relationship with the interagency. We have an amazing relationship uh, with lead federal agencies uh, to ensure that we can do everything we can do to uh, defend and take care of the homeland. So, you know, every day I wake up, um, I sit back and I say thank you. Uh, and I'm grateful for the honor and the privilege uh, to be a commander, and I'm grateful for the honor and the privilege uh, to have no more sacred responsibility than defending the United States of America and defending in the air domain the United States and Canada. I can't think of anything better than any U.S. citizen want, would want to do than to do just that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would be happy to take a couple questions. Thanks. Thank you, General Robinson. Anybody with questions for General Robinson, if you'd please step up to one of the two mics that we have on. Now they have to be nice ones. <laughs> and if you would please introduce yourself before asking your question. Uh, Wilson Brissett, Air Force Magazine. Good to see you again, General. Nice to see you, too. Heard you got a lot of rain in Colorado Springs this summer. <clears throat> you know, I'm still waiting for the summer. I have to tell you, Hawk, the hardest thing I did was go from Honolulu to Colorado. I had to wear, buy shoes and socks and coats, and it got dark and it got cold. <laughs> and it snowed. It's already snowed. <laughs> Sir. General, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the changes to the Open Skies Agreement. Um, what, what concerns might have motivated those changes and if you can share with us any details to what restrictions will be placed on Russian flights? So I am just catching up to this. So let me do this. Blythe, where are you? Can you get, and we'll get back to you because I don't, I don't have a good answer for you so I don't want to just say something. But let me get back to you on that because I'm just kind of catching up on all that. I've been looking at a couple other things. So if you don't mind if I can get back to you. Absolutely. I apologize. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Lieutenant Commander Jeanette Aaron Sibia, I watched you be sworn in at NORAD Northcom. <laughs> uh, I thank you for not referencing um, NORAD Trek Santa during the introduction of your command, which I find often I have to do. Um, I but do it's wanna... awesome. Let me just <laughs> tell you. Yes. I, I do want to say thank you truly um, for your motivation that your employees continue to have. Um, I did work at NORAD Northcom as the lead medical planner, and that team um, truly stays in contact. Uh, the response to Irma and uh, Puerto Rico has been phenomenal, so thank you for that. Thanks. My question concisely, ma'am, is um, among your peers, uh, who are notably male and other co-coms, um, do you find that vying for any kind of assets, um, be it um, personnel or equipment, uh, is any more a challenge based on your gender, yes or no? No. I'm a commander, right? I'm responsible providing risk assessment to the chairman and the secretary. And my role and responsibility is to say, secretary, chairman, here are the things that I need. If I can't get what I need, then, then here's the risk where we, the department, are going to assume. And they could care less about my gender. It's, it's my role and responsibility to do, to, to, to do that. It's good to hear, ma'am. Thank yep. you. You bet. General Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. I heard you were going to be here. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, the Russian no, one. 
The Russian military just recently, uh, last week, completed a major exercise in Belarus called Zapad, yep. in which uh, it was related there was some strategic exercising going on as well. What, if anything, came out of that exercise that concerns you uh, from defending the homeland? And right. the second part of this, you talked about your dealings with Admiral uh, Tid. Have you seen any credible evidence that terrorist organizations are actually trying to get in through the southern border, either through the special interest aliens or some other way? Thank yeah, you. Thank you. So I guess the biggest thing I would say about the Russian exercise, and we're going to do a deep dive in this next week, and so again, I'm just starting to scratch the, a little bit of the surface, is this ability to hold targets at risk at ranges that we're not used to. Uh, to me, you know, as I sit back and I, and you know, here's the most interesting part. How many of you have looked at Russia from the North Pole, right? So if you look at Russia from the North Pole and you sit back and you see where the ranges with which they can hold targets at risk and then look at it from the North Pole, that's the way I look at Russia. I don't, I don't look over there. So, so right now the first thing is, is holding targets at risk at ranges that we're not used to. Um, and then, like I said, next week I'm gonna do a deeper dive into all of that. Um, so if you wanna get with Scott and we can chat. Um, and then the second question, I'm sorry. Just your, your internet actions with Admiral Tid in terms of the border and whether there is any credible information of terrorists trying to infiltrate through the southern. So, the southern. so what, um, in this form, what I would say to you is we pay attention to everything, right? And um, what's, again, I don't look per commodity, I look at the network and what is it that we can do to disrupt the network. And that's kind of the way that both Kurt and I are looking at that, uh, along with Tony Thomas, to see what's happening as we move through. I mean, you know, it, as you sit back and you look at Central Command and you've watched stuff march west, right? And so it, it behooves me to pay attention to that to see if anything continues to come west and, and into the southern approaches. Thank you. No, thank you. We'll get back with you on the first question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Um, Oriana Pollock with Military.com. Uh, you spoke at a conference in Ottawa in February, and you had told audiences that um, the U.S. and Canada have stood up a binational steering group to manage the eventual replacement of the uh, North Warning System. Yep. And I wanted to know, could you give us a status update of what that committee has found and how yep. we're moving or progressing forward? Yeah, on? that's a great question. So, you know, if I sit back and I look at uh, the North Warning System and I think about the time when I was a young lieutenant as an air battle manager, you know, and one of the places that we got to go to uh, was up north, right? And there were those sites up there. But I, if I look at uh, the capability and capacity of Russian bombers at the time and over time how things have changed, and by the way, uh, next year is the 60th anniversary of NORAD. Uh, that lets you know how long that binational command and agreement has been about. You know, things have changed, right? So my, I need to be able to detect, track, uh, ID and engage at ranges that defend Canada and the United States in the air domain. So we've started an analysis of alternatives with Air Combat Command, and um, we are just beginning that work, and I think we should read out that work, uh, I think either this winter or next spring. I don't remember the time, but you know that's kind of where we're at with all of that. And just to make sure, because the last thing I wanna do is say, upgrade the radar, right? I wanna say, here's my requirements, and here are the things that I'm looking at. What can we do to, to make that happen? Can you give us a glimpse of some of those examples of what you're looking at? No, because I, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, the team is working on it. All right, you bet. Sorry, I'm not trying to, yeah, thanks. Ma'am. Ma Vivian Mashi with National Defense Magazine. Um, so over the past few weeks, you have had to deal with supporting operations in Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, uh, Mexico, West Coast wildfires, maintaining a watchful eye on North Korea and all of the- uh, And Florida. In Florida, yes, and all of the places that you've mentioned before. So do you have the capabilities you need right now to continue to maintain this level of operational tempo yeah. in the future? And if so, what capabilities do you need? So here's what I'm gonna tell you. First of all, I have incredible commanders, subordinate commanders. I, I uh, was talking uh, yesterday with my Marine component commander and my Navy component commander and, uh, you know, to ask, do you have the things that you need uh, in order to sustain until we, you know, figure out more, you know, what's happening in Puerto Rico? Not under, 
more to understand to make sure we get the right stuff there at the right place. Yes, um, I have incredible subordinate commanders. I have an incredible staff. Um, I would tell you right now, uh, without all of those people, I would probably tell you I need more stuff. But if you saw my interview uh, in Texas, uh, right after Harvey and I was talking to the, uh, to the governor, Secretary Mattis, and he has been very on point with this as well as the chairman, you just tell us what you need and, and we'll make it happen. You'll probably see here in the next for Puerto Rico, 12 to 24 hours, you know, we're gonna start even more stuff, right? You have to understand what's happening on the ground so you don't add to the burden, um, but to make sure you put the right capability and capacity. So whether it's power generators, whether it's water and food, uh, those are things we've already been shipping in. But I would, I would tell you that uh, between the staff and amazing subordinate commanders and amazing, quite frankly, Pentagon uh, has been unbelievably supportive of everything that we're doing. Um, I, I feel very comfortable where we are from being able to get the jobs that the, that the National Command Authority has asked us to do. If I could follow up, just yes. to clarify. Um, if you're looking more in a more forward way, so after seeing all of these scenarios play out, just to anticipate if you know some sort of operational tempo like this continues, what are some of the technologies and capabilities yeah. that might need to stock up more? Yeah. So this, so we haven't caught our breath yet, um, and so what I would tell you, in fact, I was talking to the chairman this morning. One of the things we really want to do is once we do is go back and go, okay, what lessons can we learn? To, to get to your point. For me personally, do we have the right faces in the right places in the right spaces in the command from a staff perspective? Uh, did we have our C2 right? And did we look at having the right capability and, and capacity at the right place? So to me, that's a lesson learned thing and, and that is definitely something I wanna turn around back and look at because uh, I think there are some things that we'll be able to learn. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Patrick Tucker with Defense One. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, the importance of your job is in the news pretty much every day now. So uh, I wondered if you could address a specific question. Uh, Josh Pollack from CNS uh, last week pointed out that our um, interception capabilities against a North Korean ICBM, if we were to intercept it in midair because of that North Pole that's trajectory, uh, they would have to come very close to Russian airspace. And so I wondered if you could talk very briefly about how uh, our relationship with Russia complicates our missile defense against North Korea. And more broadly, I wonder if you could touch on the most important change you're putting in place at NORAD to better our defenses against North Korean uh, efforts. Thanks. So, um, you know, what you have to look at uh, before you have the conversation about intercepting uh, North Korean interceptors is the azimuth with which they decide to shoot. So what you have to do is sit down and go, okay, what's the azimuth? And then, you know, what, when would we, uh, when would be the right time to take the best shot to defend? Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's about all I'll say in this forum, um, you know, because, uh, that's what I'll say. Um, and, and then what's the most important thing I'm changing in NORAD uh, in the air domain, I think would, will be as we uh, look at how do we, again, go back to the question about our infrastructure, you know, our, uh, from a material perspective, looking at our infrastructure, uh, looking at uh, the homeland defense design, uh, what are those things that we're doing to, to be better? Uh, and then how do we look long term, you know, not just to five or 10, but we have a project we're working on. What does it look like, you know, 30 or 40 years from now? And, and, and what are some of the things that we can think about? Okay, a very quick follow-up. I know that yep. there's a ton about uh, that first bit you can't speak on, and uh, that's all very well and good. It sounds like it is something that is a concern of yours. Can you? Uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't use that characteristic. It's something that I'm aware of. And, and, and you know, it's uh, something that we work our way through. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Meredith Summers. I'm with Federal News Radio, and the reporter in front of me kindly asked my question. And so, but since I've already made my way down here, <laughs> I'm hoping to maybe drill down on it a little bit more. Well, just ask another one. Can you ask a little? Or, or, were there? I know you said you have, still have to catch your breath, but were there any best practices or any highlights you don't even need to wait to look back on and go, this really worked or this really didn't when it comes to uh, the storm mitigation and reaction? That kind of no, thing. No. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, I, here's what I would say. 
I'm just really incredibly proud of the team. You know, if I sit back and I think about, and you know, so every morning at eight o'clock I have an ops and intel, right? And you know, when you're sitting there in your ops and intel and you're watching Harvey and it doesn't look like it's gonna be anything and then 24 hours later it's crazy, right? And then you kind of see Irma and then you see this other thing and then you see this other thing out there. You know, you just wanna crawl up and go, wow. Um, I, I think the thing that I would highlight and that I've been very proud of and pleased with is the teamwork uh, and the can-do attitude to make it happen, not for the command, but for the citizens of our United States. I saw a great interview two nights ago when somebody said, you know, I go do this downrange for a living, but to have the privilege to bring stuff to citizens of the United States and, and take care of our American citizens, you know, I can't think of a greater privilege. And so for me right now, that to me is what's important, not just amongst the staff and my commanders, but the teamwork that we have with the Pentagon uh, and the support that we're giving from the secretary and the chairman. That's probably the, the, the greatest thing that I think is just amazing. So more personnel? <laughs> <laughs> we'll let the services worry about that. Ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Uh, Lara Seligman with Aviation Week. Thank you for being here. I didn't here. realize this was a press conference. <laughs> 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 um, so I wanted to ask you, um, does the Air Force and NORTHCOM have any plans to assume control of the ground-based mid-course defense system? And um, what, what would that do, or how would that change the way that you do the Homeland okay. Defense mission? So I, I won't speak for the United States Air Force. I'll let General Goldfein do that. Um, but what I will say is as we go through the ballistic missile defense review, General Heighton and I, uh, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is getting roles and missions right and do we have it right in the UCP. And so that's kind of one of the things that I know they're looking at in that, and that will kind of get after depending upon what the outcome of the ballistic missile defense review is, you know, what those roles and missions and then what does that change, if anything, the things that I'm responsible for day in and day out. Can you expand it all on? No, we're happened? still in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, if I could ask a broader question. Oh, of course. Um, just um, uh, <laughs> General Goldstein talks a lot about uh, multi-domain command yep. and control and networking yep. everything yep. together. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of your efforts to do that with um, missile defense in particular. Yeah. So so one of the things that uh, there's a couple things I'll talk about with that. One is you know um, just the whole multi-domain C2 I think is an uh, an amazing effort uh, from the United States Air Force. I had the privilege to sit down with the folks that are working on it just to, to try and understand it not as an airman but as a joint commander and then what is it that I do in my uh, ops center you know to link into what he's doing and what the United States Air Force is doing if I sit back and I look at an architecture you know from a uh, from a, a, a um, uh, missile defense perspective, you know, we've got a, a nice architecture in place, but obviously there's places where that's aging out and we need some help. So we're looking at what is it that we need to do and how do we replace or, you know, make a, a, a longer lifespan in that. And then and then if, if John Height was standing here, you know, it'd be okay. And when do we transition some of the capabilities to space, right? And so I think if we, if, as we look long term, you know, it, John Height was here, he said, you can't put a radar on every island in the Pacific, right? You've heard him say that. Um, and, and so now, what do we need to do? Because if we go back to the fact that, you know, the amount of testing and not afraid to fail in public, and we look at the speed with which Kim Jong-un has, you know, made some capabilities, you know, we need to keep up with that speed. And so, so how does that architecture look in five or 10 years? When do we transition some of the capabilities to space, you know, but we can't rely on space. So we, you know, how do we do that? And so this is so, those are some of the dialogue and talks that we're talking about. And then, you know, quite frankly, you know, if I go back to now, you know, General Goldfein, you know, there's a theater and regional defense, right, from a missile defense perspective, depending upon the range of the missile that's being shot. And then there's an intercontinental missile defense. And so how do I, looking at what the Air Force is doing, how do I integrate what, what we're thinking about to the way that the Air Force is thinking about? Thank you. You bet. Ma'am. Hi, ma'am. I'm Sarah Maples. I'm the Director of National Security and Foreign Affairs for the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I'm also, um, excuse me, <clears throat> An Air Force veteran. Yay! 
And uh, I wanted to Is this an Air Force question? Uh, <laughs> sort of. So, um, I actually um, wanted to change the conversation a little bit and Good. say, first of all, thank you for your service. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks. I don't like public speaking, so I apologize. Um, That's OK. I don't either. What? <laughs> Uh, you often describe yourself as a general or a commander who happens to be a woman. And um, I don't think all of us have that luxury. Yep. And I think your example uh, helps make it easier for the rest of us to be seen as someone who can do our jobs who happens to be a woman. And I was wondering if you had any advice that you could provide for yeah. those of us in the audience as well yeah. as those who are serving and other yeah. women veterans for how we can further assist in being seen yeah. as an individual, a professional who happens to be a woman. Hey, I, I, really, I really appreciate that. I, you know, see this guy right there? That was my role model, you know? And, and it wasn't about what wings he wore on his chest, and it wasn't about that he wasn't a woman. It was about that he cared to be the very best fighter pilot in our United States Air Force. When I was a young captain uh, back in, okay, 86 or 7, um, and I was the first and only for quite a while um, female instructor at the Fighter Weapons School. And that's what it was back at the time. It was F-15s, F-16s, A-10s, F-111s transitioning out of F-4s. And I was, you know, the only female there. What I realized very quickly from my role models, fighter pilots, was that what was important was being the best that you could be at whatever anybody asked you to do. The greatest compliment I ever got in my entire life was when I go to war, I want Lori on the radio. I, I, I couldn't ask for anything else. And so what I learned from my experience of my three years at Nellis Air Force Base in the 80s was what was important was aptitude. So no matter what they asked you to do, or every time I sat down on a mission, I wanted to stand up from that mission and be able to walk into the debrief with the guys that I'd been talking to on the radio and have them say thank you. That's it. Thank you to be a part of that team so that when they went to war, they wanted me. I also realized it was about attitude, right? Um, I'm a glass half full kind of person. You know, um, every day is not perfect. Life is really short. I've learned a lot of life lessons. But what I have realized, you know, that how I am as a commander and how I am as a person, whenever I walk into the room, everybody pays attention. And, and so for me, what's so important is having a positive attitude. Is every day perfect? Absolutely not. You know, but, but that attitude is really incredible. Because what I've discovered is, you know, with the aptitude and attitude, the opportunities that I've been afforded, not because of the wings that I wear, not because of being a, a woman, but because I had people that trusted in me that didn't care about those things, but I tried to be the very best I could be each and every day. And I happened to be lucky and blessed to have mentors like Hawk Carlisle that showed me that's how you do that. Um, so what I would tell everybody here, you know, we all have had our experiences. I can, I can, I can tell you stories that would curl your toenails. <laughs> but that's, that's not what it's about. For all of us, you know, as we sit back, and it's not easy. I, 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 it, 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 there are so many places we can all point. You know, I, I, you, I, I appreciate the fact that you've got the commander, general airman, I happen to be a woman, but I do realize that I have a role and responsibility 
in the in the opportunities that I've been given and that I am I not I I've been the first to maybe a couple of things. And we all have that role and responsibility. Um, and so I, 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 I cherish that, I embrace that, but I'm, I, I work very hard every day to be the best that I can be at whatever task or tasks, as somebody mentioned, have been given to me. And I think for me, that, that has been coupled with people trusting me and putting me in places that weren't normal for my badge and gender, that's been my success. Thank you. Was that helpful? That was wonderful. Okay. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. Thank you for your service. Oh, my honor. I could have heard you speak on that topic uh, all day. Thanks. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Sue Steinke, not with the media. Yes. <laughs> Keep I love media. <laughs> Key point government solutions and a former civilian with the Air Force, with Thanks. the 544th ISR group. Yay. Um, defending, defending the homeland. From the very um, most tactical point of view, it's about the right people in the right place. It's about capacity and readiness. Readiness is tied very tightly to security clearances. We must give those same people the clearances to get the job done and to protect the, the homeland. Uh, we know there are a lot of problems in that sphere right now. I was wondering what, if you had any particular views on security clearance reform. No, I don't. You know, I, I, well, so I'll twist it a different way because I don't have particular because I haven't encountered, you know, uh, anything. But what I will say is as a commander, I'm privileged to be able to to pick leadership both uh, in the headquarters and throughout the components. Uh, and so I depend on that leadership to help me so I don't have that. But I haven't encountered or, or have a particular view. Here's what I do know, though. I, um, you know, our nation trusts us. Right, our nation trusts us uh, with valuable things and valuable information, and it's up to each and every one of us to protect that. And when I talk about it, I talk about protecting our nation, and that to me is what's important in the in the message that I try to carry forward. Thanks. Thanks for your service. You, yep. Yes, ma'am. Afternoon, ma'am, or morning. Um, mm -hmm. For me, Army veteran here. Yay. Um, again, thank you for showing all of us women and men where the bar and women in defense can be set at. Thank you. Um, as I can sh be sure that a lot of women here can attest and a lot of saw in the military and even out, uh, a lot of the times whenever a woman has something to say, we're often ignored for our opinion or a male comrade, his opinions valued higher and often find that we're mansplained, often talked over, voices are raised in order to drown ours out. I'm sure not in your position now, you don't encounter it as much, but leading up to it, especially serving in the time you did, when you encountered situations like that, how did you handle them? How did you get by them? So, yeah, thanks. You know, what's really interesting to me, so I'm going to go back again to my time at Nellis Air Force Base as a, as a young captain, because I think it was one of the most formative times for me personally. You know, I remember getting there, and again, as the only woman, and um, sitting down in, uh, in, in, you know, at the time, uh, the classes started three times a year. So it was uh, three times a year, you know, a bunch of new fighter pilots would come in, and they can be pretty cocky. And um, right, Hawk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, but. But you know, when I, when I sat back and I thought about it, I want them to be, right? If it's them versus somebody else, they need to believe in themselves and believe in their capabilities, right? But you know what I watched? Um, I watched us sit down and do a briefing to get ready to go do whatever mission we're gonna practice on the Nellis Ranges. I watched us execute this mission, and then I watched us come back and debrief this mission, and we would take all rank off, even to the point where our wing commander, who was a one-star, would, would take the rank off, where our two-star commander would take the rank off, and we would be very candid and very straightforward and, and very much, here's the things that our objectives, here are the things we said we were gonna do, and here are the things that went right, and here are the things that went bad, and here are the ways that we get better so that we don't do these things bad again. 
But the most important thing I watched was we would walk out of that debrief, we would all put our rank back on, and we would take care of each other. I, I, I hadn't seen that in my career, in my career field. And so what I learned from that is the importance of, of being rational, the importance of being factual, the importance of, of knowing that, that the credibility that you have starts there. And, and so, you know, over time, what happens and happened is that, you know, if it came down to wondering about command and control, people would go, well, go ask Lori, right? So for me, it, it began there as a credibility issue. It began there as a foundational issue. And what I would just say, in, 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 plus these guys are now afraid of me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, what, what I would say, what I would say for me is, you know, ha, I, I don't ever, it, so it started there. And so, you know, as you go from here to there, it's how many times have you been called emotional? Right? And when we get, when we get passionate about something, how many of us have been called emotional? Oh, you're being emotional, right? So, so how, how, do you, how do you keep the passion, because passion's important, but how do you ensure that you maintain facts and, and rationalism to prevent that? That, to me, is what's important to, to tamp down and not have what you just talked about. Um, and and um, I just... I, I, I've just really worked really hard on that my entire career, and it hasn't always been perfect, but I've tried really hard to make that the foundation of any conversation that I have so that I don't get, you know, over-talked and overturned. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but that's just kind of how I've been. Is that helpful at all? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for your service, too. You as well. Yep. Hi there, Emma Westerman from Rand Corporation. You are obviously incredibly busy, but in a <laughs> position of undeniable knowledge. Um, so how do you carve out time to mentor and to breed the next generation of leaders? So I think anytime you stand up in front of an audience, you're mentoring, right? I think the opportunity you stand up in front of anybody, whether you're doing a commander's call in front of your command, where you have a privilege to do this, whether you're testifying in front of Congress, I think anytime you sit and, and talk to anybody, it's that opportunity to mentor. And, and so it's how do you present your message and how do you uh, make sure that um, you know, you're not only talking about today, but thinking about the generation uh, that's following you. And so for me, because I had such great mentors and because I had people that were passionate about not Lori Robinson, but our next airman and our next airman and our next airman, you know, I think it's my role and my responsibility to do the same thing. And, and so I take it very seriously. Um, I try very, very hard to make sure that I do carve out that time. Um, and, and not that I'm perfect. Heaven knows I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But I try really hard to take the lessons that I've learned over time to pass them on. And as important to me is to, to make sure that the airmen that we've got coming up and now in my current command, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, you know, that, that I let the services know what great folks that they have, but sit down and take the time to chat with them. I, re I try really hard. I'm not perfect at it, but I try really hard. Thank you. You bet. I think we two more and that's it. Can we take these last two questions? Okay. I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ma'am. Ma'am, thank you very much for your service, for your comments, for the example that, that you set for everyone in this room. I'm Morgan Hitzig. I work for a company called Data Miner, but I also am dual-hatted Navy reservist. Oh, great. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is transitioning a little bit back um, to sort of what you're thinking through on the strategic side, coupled with a little bit of Hurricane Harvey response. Uh, one of the former panelists came up and said, you know, uh, global warming is something that we should be thinking about from a strategic perspective. You have an eye and a half on North Korea, the other half of an eye on Iran. How are you sort of placing global warming, if at all, as a major threat to the homeland? Yeah, so, you know, 
uh, I, uh, one of my roles and responsibilities as the commander of NORTHCOM is the advocate for Arctic capabilities. Uh, and so in that capacity, I look and see what's happening in the Arctic. Um, I, I probably look at it from a different perspective as, as I watch um, uh, the name of the boat. The, the cruise ship that went through Celebrity Seas or last year and this year, the first time in the summertime, right? Watching a cruise ship go through the Northwest Passage and north of Canada. So as I look at it now, you know, I won't comment do I agree or not with global warming, but what I do see is something that's happening that hasn't happened before in this, this cruise ship is, you know, what would happen? What would we worry about if something should happen to that, that cruise ship? So I look at it from the perspective as, you know, you know what's happening and, and does it change my calculus and and so I uh, we're working on a, a commander's estimate uh, for uh, the Arctic uh, and I think we'll sit back and go are there different capabilities and things that we need given the changing nature of the Arctic and uh, uh, the, the uh, changing um, way that we're thinking about the Arctic so that's kind of where my head is at when it comes to that Thanks. Thank you. You bet. Ma'am. LT. <laughs> yep. I haven't seen an LT in a long time. We were aware on the Pentagon. <laughs> uh, oh, you are? <laughs> Lieutenant Maris Glenn, Dover Air Force Base. Uh huh. Ma'am, what is your personal leadership philosophy when it comes to leading airmen and people, especially today when we seem to have a tendency on focusing or stovepiping on the mission and being accused of being almost too caring when it comes to people and how has it evolved over the years? Wow. I've, I've never been accused of that. Thanks, LT. Um, so to me, there's a couple things about leading airmen and taking care of families. You know, we recruit the, the member and we retain the family. Uh, I, uh, I can't even begin to tell you how important a family is uh, because so many times decisions are made uh, based on what we think is, uh, is best for our family. And there's no, absolutely no judgment there, uh, but that's the importance of understanding that we recruit the member and we retain the family. The second big thing I talk about when I talk about leading airmen is that it's not about me. That we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And that it's about the institution. And it's about our honor and our privilege and the thing that we get to do each and every day is to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. That's what it's about. And, and so, so when I sit back and I think about standing front, in front of airmen, I, I talk about their families and thank them for their service and the thing that they do each and every day to defend our nation and to support and to defend the Constitution. That's what leading airmen and taking care of families is all about. Because each and every one of you that are serving, have served, will serve, you're gonna stand up and that's what you're gonna say. I'll support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I'll bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And so that's what being, uh, having the privilege to lead airmen, to be a commander, and to stand up each and every day and defend our nation. So I don't think that that's too over caring. Uh, I am, um, I'm proud and privileged. Hawk, thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm our women in defense. Room. This is terrific. I'm going to step up here. Yep. Yep.